Sunday. Well, thank you so much for being here. There are a few first-time visitors here today, and I know some that are new over the last couple of three weeks after the service. I'd love to meet you uh, down here at the front if you have time. <clears throat> and also, Ernie told me that Don Carruthers is here, and I think he pointed over here. Don, stand up, would you? <clears throat> Those of you who don't know Don, Don was here years ago, 13 years ago. He now lives in Oklahoma. He was over the tower, responsible for that during the Olympics, and uh, he built a lot of the walls that you have over in the junior high wing and all kinds of stuff. Huge part of our church for a number of years, and he uh, was in Idaho for business on his way through back to Oklahoma and stopped for church. And I, if you don't have time after the service, I understand Ernie said you had to scoot out pretty quickly, but thank you so much. Let's give him a hand for all he's done for those years back. Amen. <clears throat> It's the beauty of Christian Life Center. There's people that for various reasons have moved away, but they were a part in a time and place, and they did a, a, a vital part of uh, pushing forward the ministries here, and we have never forgotten them, and thank you so much. Well, we're here today. Let's thank God for the opportunity to be here, pray over this message, and get into the material today. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the privilege that we have each Sunday to be here and to worship you with our church family, to make new friends to see people come to you, and to know your love and your grace and mercy. Pray your anointing upon our time today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last week there were four or five that came forward for salvation. I didn't get the exact number, but thank the Lord for what he's doing in all of our lives. The oldest computer can be traced back to Adam and Eve, and surprise, surprise, it was an apple. <laughs> but it had extremely limited memory, just one bite, and then everything crashed. And for what it's worth for you all, God wants total custody, not just weekend visits. Ouch, that one was a little closer to home, huh? And uh, this one I think you'll find, at least from a pastor's point of view, rather humorous. If done properly, being a pastor is a walk in the park. Jurassic Park, but a park. But today we're going to talk about the clash of cultures, okay? It's a very powerful message, clash of cultures. Our text will come from 1 John chapter 5, verse 15. Not the Gospel of John, but 1 John, just before you get to Revelation. And I want to talk to you today about culture. You have to understand the definition of culture. Culture, by definition, is a set of shared values, attitudes, goals, and practices that characterizes an organization. Now, culture will be found not only in an organization like a church or a business that you work at or the Air Force or the Marines or whatever, a school, uh, but it can be found and will be found in every family, state, as I said, a church, a region of the country like the Southeast or the South or the Northeast or the West Coast or Utah. There's a culture to all of these regions that dominates the country in general and the world uh, more broadly speaking. So there are cultures uh, that pretty much characterize the generalities of those particular areas. There's no question that we live in a world today where everyone is different and yet very much the same. There's a lot of diversity here among us at Christian Life Center, but there's also a lot of sameness. There's a lot of diversity between uh, people who attend church regularly and people who do not, but there's a lot of sameness as well. There's no question that this world has a culture tied to it. And let's go to our text for just a moment and read 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 19. We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. It's very important for us as serious followers of Christ to understand that Jesus and the disciples, the authors of the New Testament, all were very clear that in this world we have two different groups of people. 
in general speaking, broad terms. We have the Christian people, the church world, the church culture that worships God, the followers of God. And then you have the world culture that is at best ambivalent towards God, unaccepting of Him, and in most cases, just plainly anti-God when you get right down to it. So you really have two different cultures at work, the God culture and the non-God culture or the anti-God culture. In our text in 1 John 5, 19, it clearly describes these with the words, children of God and the whole world. You have two different groups, the children of God and the whole world. Now make no mistake about it, every human being on this planet, I don't care how you live your life, what choices you make, every person on this planet was created in the image of God. There's a whole sermon on all of that. In the church world, we find our identity through God and our relationship with Him and the purpose for which we were created and the eternity for which we will live. Those who are in the world culture have replaced their identity with being created in the image of God with an identity that comes from what they do and how they feel. And it takes them down a completely different path even though many want to reach back and pull out of the church culture or out of the Jesus culture, we'll talk about that in a moment, and apply it to their life. But the reality is they have stepped out of the fundamental teaching of Scripture that we are all, everyone, 100% of the human race, created in the image of God, but we are not all living with an awareness, understanding, appreciation, or desire to continue to fulfill uh, our journey to be like Christ, which means to develop in the image of God that He has created us in. Are you still with me? Okay, that's just some foundational stuff. But there's the Christian culture and there is the world culture. We as Christians, we live in submission to God under His control. It's not our will, but His will be done. And that sometimes brings some very difficult choices. While the world is in submission to the evil one, some are, are uh, overtly in that. Others are just, by virtue of not being in the church culture, or in the God culture, not living in submission to God. They are living under the submission of the evil one. It's just, there's no right in the fence. You're either on one side or the other. And the clarity between these two cultures is quite obvious. So let's look at the clash of the culture that every one of us deal with every day in our life. I'm sharing this message with us today because every day, every one of us deal with this. Every one of us. So let's look at it in your notes. You've got a lot of filling in to do today, so you're going to earn your keep. Number one, what is the culture of Jesus? That's the first thing you have to establish. When you look at the clash of the cultures, the God versus the, the evil one, what, what is the culture of Jesus? Now, listen very closely to me today. I'm a Bible teacher preacher. I'm not a culture preacher teacher, okay? I'm not into pop culture or any of the rest of it. I'm just into the Bible. So what is the Jesus culture? Believe what you will about Jesus. Now, I say that because I hear people tell me what they believe about Jesus, and I'm not trying to be smart, Alec. I'm saying you don't have a clue who Jesus is. And there's no excuse for that. Those of you that are new, I, I use reference out of the NIV Bible. That's the New International Version. Why do I do that? Because it's modern English, not King James English. You all know about the old King James Bible. It's a little tough to read in this day and age. And it's written at a seventh grade level. I like that. That's easy. If you have a seventh grade education, you can read your Bible, and you should not be confused as to who Jesus is. But you have to read it, and you can't gloss over things that is like a, ooh, ouch, mm, don't like that. No, you got to read it all. So who is Jesus? Believe what you will about Jesus. But nobody else, listen, this is going to shake you in your boots because it's counter to what you hear today in the Christian thing. Believe what you will about Jesus, but nobody else created more controversy 
than Jesus Christ. Nobody. He was not a walk around and everybody just having tulips and going, oh, isn't it a great world? Jesus caused chaos everywhere he went. He also changed more lives. And he did more to shape culture and shift more of history than any other person on this planet. He challenged the hypocrisy of the church people and the sin of the world. He was not Mr. Everybody Lovey Lovey and hey, 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 hey. When Jesus walked into a room, controversy broke out. Because he was very direct, even if his words were soft. There are plenty of examples in Scripture where Jesus used very soft words. There are also many cases of Scripture where Jesus was very blunt and direct, and you might want to use the word harsh. Read it all and you'll see. No one has taught more provocatively about life's meaning nor walked with greater authenticity than Jesus Christ. I will tell you that as a human being and as your pastor, I don't need you to tell me my faults, though if you do it kindly and in the right way, I'll take it, but I already know a lot of my thoughts, or a lot of my faults, rather. And in my thoughts as I share the Word of God with you, I'm painfully aware that I'm not a perfect vessel standing before you. What helps me is I'm painfully aware that you're not either, so that's okay. But Jesus was perfect, and the Bible says, without sin. Now, surely, such a defining figure as Jesus deserves a closer look by the skeptics, by the cynics, and by believers alike. Who is this Jesus that we lay claim to? You might discover, as millions have, and as four or five did last Sunday after the service, that Jesus is not only as real as the Bible says he is, but that he truly loves you as much as the Bible says he does. This is the goodness of Jesus. It was part of the songs that we sang in worship today, how good he is. Our responsibility on this planet, as it relates to Jesus and his culture, is to do our part in reaching people for Jesus. And in doing so, we can see people saved from their sins and the culture of the world and see them brought into the kingdom of God, the culture, if you please, of Jesus Christ. It's very important that you understand this, that the culture of Jesus, we talk about what is the culture of Jesus here under point number one. The culture of Jesus is the shared biblical, listen, biblical values attitudes, and practices that glorify Jesus Christ. You want to know what the Jesus culture is? Jesus culture is biblical values, not the world's values, not the American Christian values, the biblical values, the biblical attitudes about things in this life, and the practices of our life, how we live our life. That all brings glory to Jesus Christ. We are to show the world who Jesus really is. Not just picking out the good and everybody just having a love fest. Certainly not picking out what the world would see as bad, which would have words like commitment, deny yourself, taking up your cross and following him, not my will but your will be done. Not just even that but the totality and the rightness of who Jesus is. Not the modified Jesus that satisfies our American culture, scratch and itch, but the biblical Jesus. To be in the Jesus culture, we simply are disciples of God's Word. God's Word. Not a fellow Christian. God's Word. Certainly not the world, God's Word. And we allow the Holy Spirit to have His way in us. That's what being a part of the Jesus culture 
is all about. Now, I want to read quickly some scriptures for you because we do have several. In the Gospel of John now, you're familiar with the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. In John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32, Jesus here is a speaker, the speaker. Here's what he says. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Now notice that. Jesus gives the qualifications for you to be a Christian, to be in the Jesus culture, to be a disciple. He says, you have to hold on to my teaching. You can't substitute American Christianity for biblical Christianity and still lay claim to being his disciples. And he makes that very clear with a single word. The word really. If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Why is that word used? Because back then and for 2,000 years up to this very day, there are people who lay claim to being a disciple of Jesus Christ, but they in fact are not because they are clearly living in diametrically the opposite or violation of Scripture while laying claim to Him being their Lord and Savior. And he says, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Also in the Gospel of John, chapter 16, and verse numbers 13 and 14, again, Jesus is the speaker here. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. You need truth because there's false teaching, and that includes false teaching as it relates to who God is and what God's relationship with us is supposed to look like. He goes on and says he will not speak, talking about the Holy Spirit, he will not speak on his own, he will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. The Father sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for your sins and mine. He was resurrected on the third day. We're going to celebrate that next week. The Holy Spirit, the Comforter, has been sent to enable and to help the human race to see Christ and, in turn, the perfected image of God through Christ so that we might know who God is. It's a powerful uh, help for us to understand this, and he will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you, and it goes on. I want to read something that a lot of people know around here. I reference it once a year usually, but maybe more often, but it's germane to what we're talking about today. It's still in the Gospel of John, but this is chapter 6, verse number 60. And then verses 66 to 69. Now, this is going to shake some of you. In John chapter 6 and verse number 60, Jesus has been doing some heavy teaching. As I said, the real Jesus is not a fluffy, duffy Easter egg bunny that everybody just has a lot of fun with. He came to this earth to die for a serious issue, the sin that separates man that began with Adam and Eve and dumped us into what is referred to as the original sin for which we need redemption from. It's another whole deep theological discussion. But Jesus gives all this heavy stuff, and here's what happens in the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verse 60. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, now these are his disciples, what does that mean? It means people who said, I'm following Jesus. I suppose they might have already even been baptized, it would appear. But they said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And then in verse 66, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Do you see the seriousness of that? Jesus, in verse 67, you do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. 
These were part of the church family. And Jesus said, look, if you're going to follow me, I'll paraphrase, you're going to have to separate yourself from the world, come out from among the world, and be ye separate, if you want to throw a little King James in there, the Y-E, ye. Y'all, ye, get it? And these guys said, Lord, you're asking us to blow up our lives and to walk away from our finances or whatever it may be, to be ostracized in our world because we're following you. And Jesus said, now you're getting it. Oh, that's too hard. And they turned and walked away. And Jesus looked at the 12 and he said, are you boys going too? Because Jesus didn't come to play church. He came to die for the sins of the world. And to defeat the enemy of our soul that goes all the way back to a long time ago. And it goes on, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. You might want to pencil this somewhere in your mind, if not your notes. We are to follow the biblical Jesus not the American Jesus. Because I assure you they are two separate Jesuses. Number two, the world culture versus the Jesus culture. We live in a world culture that is diametrically different than the Scripture or the culture that we see in Scripture. I want to go back to the Gospel of John for just a moment. Chapter 17. Hang on here. I'm going to turn to it. There it goes. Sorry, my little marker. Not that I didn't know where John was, but my marker slipped down. John chapter 17, verse 9 to 21. It's a little lengthy, but listen closely here. John chapter 17, verse 9 to 21. And notice that Jesus, again, is the speaker. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world. See, there's two different cultures here. The one who is sensitive to God and the one who is not. Let's not get off on a tangent here, but the world doesn't care what Jesus thinks. Jesus says, I pray for them, I'm not praying for the world, but for those who you have given me, for they are yours. Father is what he's saying. All I have is yours and all you have is mine because Jesus and the Father are one. And glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer. But they are still in the world. And I'm coming to you, Father. But my people, our people, your people, God, Father, they are still in this world. He's talking about the world culture that is anti-God. And he's talking about his followers who are pro-God, who are Christians. And he said, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction that Scripture would be fulfilled. Judas. I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world, while I'm still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them. Do you see clearly the two different cultures? The word of God, the church world, the the Jesus culture, the biblical Jesus culture, those people, us, we, will be hated by the world because of what we believe. One of the reasons we're not as hated by the world today as we should be is because we have tried to sleep with both parties. We got two women we're trying to keep happy. Yeah, creates all kinds of problems. We're trying to keep Jesus happy in the Jesus culture, and we're trying to stay in good graces with the world culture because we have a good life here in America, and we don't want to blow it. In 
coming to you now, but I say to these things while I'm still in the world. My joy be with him. Verse 14, I've given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world. See, we are not of the world. We're in the Jesus culture, not the world culture. They are not of this world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. These words of Jesus are very clear, that the Jesus culture and the world culture are not the same. We're living in a clash of cultures today, unlike in America ever before seen. I'm not in any way excusing the sins of, the, of America in years past, which were largely led by, quote, Christian people, to be sure. Not the issue on any number of levels today. But we are living in a clash of cultures today that is more distinct than ever before in American history. The world culture in America has taken direct aim at the Jesus culture and those of us that are in it. Not a, it's no longer a live and let live world that we live in in America. You're either on my side or the other side. And there is this going on and people are playing for keeps. People are fighting for their beliefs, their, their power, their money, and their security. Make no mistake about it, it's a spiritual war, and it is for keeps with eternity at stake. In your notes, you'll see a lengthy description there of the world culture and the Jesus culture. The world culture in America today is in full throttle effort to destroy the Jesus culture in America and everyone in it. Please trust me, that's not hyperbolic speech. I'm not overstating it. I could spend three hours with you this afternoon impromptu talking to you about this subject and citing situations, sources, and events that are going on as I speak before you this Sunday morning. We are under attack to be eradicated. Not the people who believe in the American Jesus, but the people who believe in the biblical Jesus. People don't care what you believe about Jesus until you get to the heart of biblical Jesus, and now all of a sudden they care, because now you're into real truth, and now you're into the real battle between truth and evil. So under the world culture, I'm going to try to help you with this as quickly as I can. Under the world culture, you'll see it is get as much as possible. Under the Jesus culture, it's more blessed to give than receive. Two different cultures. I can tell you this, uh, i got to move on. The next one, preserve life at all costs is the world culture. Run over your own mother to get to the top is not as outlandish as you might think it is. People do it all the time. They'll sacrifice their family, their friends, their integrity to get to the top. In the Jesus culture, we find life when we give it away. In the world culture, we need to make it to the top. In the Jesus culture, humble yourselves and He will exalt you in due time. In the world culture, it's fight to get to first place. In the Jesus culture, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Completely different cultures. The world culture versus the Jesus culture. Number three, the church culture versus the Jesus culture. Ouch, this is going to be challenging. The church culture versus the Jesus culture. Should be one and the same, but they're not necessarily. The world has a misconception of who Jesus is as well as who his church is. And the reason for that misconception is because the church in America has, has misrepresented both. 
American churches have a history for which I've given you just some, and I'm going to let you fill in the blanks quickly. American churches have a brief, brief history of emphasizing rules rather than relationships. That's not to say that there aren't places for rules. Okay? There are. There are times when it's wrong to do something, and so don't do it. But the emphasis is not on rules, but relationships. As we have a relationship with God, we have a relationship with others, and that is paramount. God has placed a priority in our relationship, and that is why He sent His only Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. We have to have the same priority for our relationships. It goes back to my statement last week in which I told you that we must be people who are willing to build bridges that can handle the weight of truth. I must be willing to have a relationship with those who are very much different from me, maybe even an enemy, if you want to use that term. But I will have a relationship as long as, and I will accept you for who you are. I didn't say I condone what you're doing and all that, but I'll, I'll have a relationship with you for who you are, and you have to, if you're going to have a relationship with me, accept me for who I am. If you want to blow up the bridge, you blew up the bridge. I didn't blow up the bridge. But rules have a place, but that's not the emphasis. The emphasis is on relationships. The same loving relationship that any parent should have when their kids are going waywardly. You still love them. You still do what you can to help them while building that parent-child relationship on a bridge that can handle the weight of truth. And if the kids blow it up, they blow it up. But please, as a parent, don't you be the one that blows it up. Also, programs rather than prayer. Programs are great. They have their place, but not at the expense of prayer. Fame rather than His name. I'm not jealous of a preacher with a bigger church or a television ministry. Not at all. But I assure you, I'm as aware as some other people are of some names out there that it's quite obvious that everything's built around that person's fame more so than the name of Jesus Christ. Gifts rather than the giver of gifts. We just go nuts over people who God has gifted them to be able to do great things. And it's okay to appreciate the giftings that God has given all of us, but not at the expense of worshiping the one who has given the gifts. Sacrificed our integrity rather than to hold on to our identity. Sacrificed our integrity rather than holding on to our identity. You've heard the old saying, everybody's got a price, right? I've been talking with pastors across the country for the last two weeks in very serious conversations, and there's been some powerful articles written on any of the news websites that you could read yourself if you cared to. But one of which was from three very well-known pastors of large churches speaking of the fact that 50% of preachers today are afraid to speak about hot-button issues in their church for fear of offending people. No question, that is a reality. Because the battle is whether or not we're following a biblical Jesus or an American Jesus. Are we in the Jesus culture or are we not? Are we part of the 12 that says, well, where would we go, Lord? Peter the speaker, you remember? You have the words to eternal life. Or are we going to be a part of those disciples in verse 60 of John chapter 6 that said what you have asked is too much and will no longer follow you? Pride of accomplishment rather than praise God for allowing us to achieve them. I have the privilege every day virtually of driving onto this campus and I have a beautiful office upstairs for $100 to the building fund, I'll let you take a tour. 
hey, got to raise money, you know. I don't have any holy anointing oil I can sell you. I just don't. But, um, but I look out my windows, all sides, and I just say, God, you have been so amazing. Every day I come to my office, and I assure you this is a fact. I, I drive, I get out of my car, I'm on this campus, I'm mindful of the hand of God through the journey of life that all of us have taken and how He has blessed us beyond measure. Everything that you see, the beauty of the ministries here that go on seven days a week through both our church and our school, which I hope none of you underappreciate the value of our school and the Christian witness that it brings to all of our students because we are truly a Christian school. We don't, we're not Christian in name only. We do it. And all of it is because of God allowing us to do this. The American church has at times misrepresented the heart of Jesus and how often we have hurt the very ones that we should have brought healing to. And make no mistake about it, in my own journey of life, I have been as guilty as anyone else of not using the right words or the right tone or the right time to address an issue that did need to be addressed, but I could have done it so much better. I understand that. And that's why, uh, that's a big part of why uh, with great humility, I stand before you every Sunday, even though I'm a strong personality and I'm very serious about preaching the Word of God. Please don't mistake that to think that I'm cocky or arrogant or don't care or I'm unmindful of why I am humbled before God, and as you should be as well. We have failed as a church many times and as preachers. Jesus didn't come to condemn the world, but to bring salvation. Back to the Gospel of John, in chapter 3 and verse number 17. I know you know this. We all know verse 16, God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, who shall ever believe in Him, shall not perish, but have eternal life. But here's verse 17. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Please do not misuse that verse. Some people read that and they think, well, God doesn't condemn me on anything I do because he said so. He didn't come to condemn me. As though there's a blanket, hey, just do what you want, sin like you want, and God doesn't care. That is not at all what he's talking about in verse 17. The verse before that, God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have eternal life whatever translations you want to use, okay? God came to save us from eternal death. It's not a matter of Him condemning us, it's a matter of us condemning ourselves. And He has come to bring us salvation and eternal life if we will listen. The church culture that has driven most churches over the centuries, over the centuries now I'm talking about, has been with an idea of work, work, work for God, and maybe he'll be happy with me. But the Jesus culture is a revelation of his grace. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, these words. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God not by works, so that no one can boast. Every one of us that are Christians here, saved by the grace of God from our sins and promised eternal life with Him, have that not because of our works, but because of His grace. Our work comes out of obedience to His Word, to preach the gospel, be a part of the family of God, do our part, but it's not to earn our salvation. His grace. Romans chapter 5. 
this is pretty heavy stuff, I know, but it's good too. Go to college and you have to pay $3,500 a semester to get this kind of stuff. Romans chapter 5, verse 15 to 18. But the gift is not like the trespass, for if the many died by the trespass of one man, that's talking about Adam and Eve and the original sin, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, that's Jesus Christ, overflow to many? And then he goes on, and for the sake of time, I'm not going to read uh, all of that, but if I can go down to verse 18 on the screen, if you can get that up there. Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, that's again Adam, also one righteous act, that's Jesus dying on the cross for our sins, in justification and life for all people. One righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. Romans chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, just dropping down in Scripture. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Pretty simple. Yes, we're saved by grace, but we don't just go living our life like we don't even know anything about God's Word. Let me quickly go over to Acts chapter 4, verse 32 and 33. All the believers were in one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. Folks, all of us need God's grace working in our lives. Let me quickly go to number four, my culture versus Jesus' culture. This is where it gets to the rubber meeting the road. My culture versus Jesus' culture. Going back to the Old Testament for just a moment, it's a reference you'll find in the New Testament with Jesus. But I want you to see where it comes from. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2 and 3. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep His commands. He humbled you causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you, and here's the key lines, that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Now, I'll bet you most all of you are familiar with Jesus citing that very scripture in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 to 4, in the early days as he is tempted when he spent 40 days in the wilderness, let's read it, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. This is Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 to 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Can you say, duh? The tempter came to him and said, if you are the Son of God, uh, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, and he's quoting what I just read to you in Deuteronomy. It is written. What does he say when he says it's written? He's talking about the Hebrew Scriptures, what you and I know of today as the Old Testament. He's citing their Scriptures as a Hebrew people, as a Jewish people. He says, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus was hungry after 40-day fast. And therefore, he was vulnerable to hunger. The goal of Satan is always to try to find a place where we are weak and to tempt us to give in to that weakness. He wanted to get Jesus by getting him to perform a little magic, if you please, and forget that he was the Son of God, to step out of God's Word and God's purpose for his life. But Jesus would have none of it. The culture of Jesus works into our being more and more as we surrender our lives over to Him. You can't, as I said earlier in some comedic ways, Jesus wants full-time custody, not weekend visits. 
you can't be a weekend warrior and that that, by average, now get this, by average of people who call themselves Christians, they only go to church once out of six Sundays, once every six Sundays. You can't claim to be a warrior for Christ with that kind of a commitment level. We have to relinquish our will and submit to His and allow Him to call the shots, transform us into the image of Jesus Christ. So, how can I move my culture to Jesus' culture? And what happens? How I do it is I surrender to Him. But what happens when we move into the Jesus culture, away from my culture to Jesus culture? I'll give them to you quickly and we're done. Boldness instead of nervousness. When you surrender it all to Christ and you have a healthy level of understanding that you're in the Jesus culture, not the world culture, and therefore the world's going to turn on you at some level, you'll have a boldness instead of a nervousness. This, is, this describes the disciples after the Holy Spirit came upon them in Acts chapter 2, verse 4, and it describes the Christians for 2,000 years who have made remain faithful to Christ's teachings at the expense of their own lives. People lost their lives. They were executed just for printing the Bible in English so that all people could read it that spoke English. I could go on. Lifts our head out of depression. Delivers us from addictions. and very importantly, gives us value. I hear it all the time in the business world, and I hear it all the time in the church world. I understand where it comes from, and I understand there's good in it. And that is, people are clamoring to be lifted in value, to be acknowledged that they are valuable, that they're a valuable employee, a valuable part of the church. I get all that. There's a place to, to encourage people. However, if you'll indulge me, a deeper look at all that will show you that it is flawed in character because the people are seeking their value from man instead of God. And it creates an unhealthiness there that cannot be satisfied. You will not really receive in your own spirit a settling of your value until you step full throttle into the Jesus culture and understand that your value comes from Him and not anyone else. I stand before you every Sunday, and it's part of every pastor's journey, wondering who will show up and who won't. Who's valuing not just coming and worshiping God and giving in an offering and hearing a sermon, because you can do that in a lot of churches, but who at some level must value hearing me speak or they wouldn't come to Christian Life Center. We all want that, don't we? But at the end of the day, it is true for me and it is true for you that as hard as emotionally that journey can be, our value ultimately comes from God. And if we'll place our life in Him, if my culture will become the G, if I will take my culture and place it in the Jesus culture, or, or if my culture reflects the Jesus culture, then as hard as it can be to have people reject me as your pastor or their pastor. And that happens. And it's hard. But as hard as that is, it doesn't knock me off course because my value comes from God. Do you understand that? And the same thing has to apply to you. So let's close. The world will reject us on many levels when we choose to live in the Jesus culture. They will. And you can bet on it. So today I would suggest you get to a point where you expect it. If you're going to live in the Jesus culture, you're going to find that no one caused more 
uh, conflict than Jesus. And if you're going to follow him, and if you're going to stand on his word, knowing when to use soft words with people as Jesus did, and knowing when to use stronger words as Jesus did, you're going to find that the world is going to hate you for that. And that world can include immediate family members, as well as fellow workers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Stand with me, would you please? Thank you for being here today. For those of you that are new with us today, you may have children to go and get to take to the Easter egg hunt, so this may not be a good time for you to come and say hello because you need to dart and get them. Catch me next week, that's fine, or the following week. But for those of you that are fairly new, I'll be here. Our prayer partners are coming right now, and I'm going to be very brief with this. Understand, next Sunday is Easter. We have an 8 o'clock outside service that's about 25 minutes long. We have two inside, well, three, but two English-speaking services, one at 9, one at 11. No 10 o'clock next week, 9 and 11, right? And then the Spanish service at 1.30. But just like last week, if you're here today and you're not a Christian, I'm giving you an invitation today to come to Jesus Christ. Next Sunday, we're going to celebrate Easter. If you're not a Christian, next Sunday doesn't mean a thing to you. Not one thing. Easter is a celebration of believers in that because He rose, we shall rise as well. So, if you want next Sunday to have meaning to you, I'm going to ask you, if you're not a Christian, to come and let one of our prayer partners pray with you, just like those four or five did last week, and they'll talk to you and lead you to Jesus Christ. No one loves you like Jesus loves you. I'm telling you that. And you were created in the image of God. Turn to Him and let that image of God rise to the top in your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You for these folks. Pray, Lord, that those that are here today, that the Holy Spirit is working in their lives, speaking to their hearts about this whole sin and salvation thing. And, and they come to a place now today where they realize you are the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and that no one comes to the Father except through you. And that today is the day they're going to step on the devil's head and they're going to come to you, Lord. They're going to give their life to you and begin a brand new life in you and the blessings that you will bring into their life as a result of that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you folks. Have a great day. See you next Sunday, 9 and 11. 9 and 11.